Disney's ESPN Dilemma and Snapchat's first public report tonight. A lot of major earnings to dissect. Helping us to sort through them all is Inside.com founder and angel investor Jason Calacanis, as well as Goodwater Capital founder and managing partner Eric Kim. Guys, good morning to you both. Good to see you. Uh, Jason, we've kicked good Disney morning. around a little bit this morning. I mean, media's getting hit. Uh, Disney's down two and a half. Did, did we find out anything last night about subs and the cable model that we didn't already know? Yeah, I, I think this is just confirmation of what we've been talking about here for well over a year, which is obviously people are cord cutting, and this is going to have a dramatic impact on the one company that has ridden the cable subscription boom better than anybody, and that's ESPN. So they're the bellwether of all cable channels when it comes to the impact of cord cutting. Now, it's going to be a massive transition because they just spent a ton of money on things like the NBA, and that's happening, uh, you know, this erosion of subscribers, you know, one or two percent of the country is going to cut the cord every month, every quarter rather, and that'll probably continue for a couple of years. The good news, uh, and I think this is very significant news, is that things like DirecTV Now uh, and um, the new YouTube TV, which is over-the-air television for about 35 bucks a month, I've had both of these services. They're both extraordinary. They're both massively addicting, and they're both a dollar a day. So they're very easily affordable by Americans. And when you start using your smartphone as your remote control, throwing what you're watching on your iPad up to the TV, or having access to live television wherever you are on vacation, if you're traveling, if you're commuting, it is an <laughs> extraordinary experience. And I actually Ryan. am bullish uh, on this ability for a whole generation of people who've forgotten about cable television to now re-engage. So, Eric. Talk to me about Snap. Reporting after the bell, it seems to me it's clearly uh, Snap versus Instagram now versus Snap versus Twitter. First earnings call, it's extremely important for management to communicate clearly. What do you think we need to listen for in particular? I think there's three things that we need to look out for. Number one is what is Snap's response to Facebook's attack on stories, their core product? Number two, user growth. Are they going to meet that seven to nine million dollar ad number that everyone's expecting? And number three, monetization. How well is their monetization going with their new ad platforms? Of those three, <coughs> we really think that Facebook stories and what Snapchat's going to do about that competition is the most important thing to look out for. Jason, I wonder how important user growth is. They said they haven't, they don't want to necessarily follow the Facebook model of becoming ubiquitous. What are the metrics that they are going to try to emphasize here? Yeah, obviously, what makes Snapchat super unique is that it's got a, a more private feel, and that's why young people are very much drawn to the service. While those y same young people might have Facebook accounts and they might check out Facebook, even daily, they're not going to share their Coachella videos or what they did last night on those public open services. So you really have a hard time uh, understanding this company unless you're a young person who's out and about living their lives and single. So people with kids who are watching or parents, they just don't understand why this is such an important service because it's so opaque. So I think Snapchat is the anti-Facebook in a way. Facebook wants to have every single person on the planet on it. Uh, what F Snapchat wants is to have the most valuable uh, niche, which they believe will be the millennials, uh, Generation C, people who are born, say, after the year 2000, uh, part of that connected generation. And they're not going to try to compete for the global uh, user base in the same way Facebook is obsessed with having everybody in their phone book. They don't want to be the phone book. They want to be the book, the black book of the cool kids on the block, and they want to monetize them uh, in a way that Facebook can't because Facebook doesn't have them and it doesn't have them for hours a day. So, you know, Snapchat is going to really get themselves into trouble if they get into the Yahoo's big problem, which was a constant comparison to Facebook. Sure. Snapchat would be, I'm sorry, constant comparison to Google. Snapchat has to establish they are something different, that they're going to grow at a different pace, and that they have a different user base who engages 10 times as much as other platforms. Uh, but right. I, I would be very cautious with the stock because it's fully valued. Well, uh, Eric, part of that uh, equation is getting the street educated, so to speak, in that business model. We talked about this prior to the IPO, and on IPO day, I mean, you're dealing with a, a street that uh, hinges on every word regarding DAUs and MAUs. Why should SNAP be any different? Uh, that's correct. This is, uh, compared to when Facebook went public and Twitter went public, this is a completely different model. If you look at their 
revenue versus their profitability. So they really need to focus on engagement. How long are people spending in the app? Because they don't have the profitability, they don't have the user growth that Facebook does. I mean, right now we have to remember that they're one-tenth the size of Facebook on a DAU basis. So to compete with that, it's really about the engagement and can they serve up those ads in a meaningful way that's not going to turn off users. Jason, it seems to me that in a way ESPN and Snap are facing a similar challenge in question, and that is, uh, can you slice the audience thinly enough and provide enough value to them that either they're going to pay more to subscribe if they're sports fans, or advertisers are going to pay more to get to them if they're the young people on Snap, uh, Snapchat. Uh, what do they have to do to succeed in that? Is it about quality content? I I is it about some other kind of differentiation? Yeah, I think ESPN is at a particular crossroads because, as all of us know, when uh, some amazing play happens, back when we were kids, uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we would turn on SportsCenter to watch the highlights. Now, you're watching the highlights in real time with commentary from citizens who are just holding up their phone and recording their TV. Uh, so you have this up-to-the-minute Twitter, Facebook feed of amazing content. ESPN is not part of that right now, and they have to become part of that dialogue, which is why you'll, you're seeing them hire some young correspondents who are very active on social media. Uh, but they'll also do a direct-to-consumer play, and I think that's going to be the real highlight for ESPN. If they can, let's say, let's say they lose 1% or 2% of their subscriber base uh, a quarter, if they can start gaining... Uh, you know, a couple of hundred thousand people a quarter are subscribing directly to ESPN to get a very special, unique package of archival footage and perhaps millennial driven content uh, that's got a little bit more edginess to it in the way MTV had edginess to us. I think that could differentiate them. And what if, yes, we wake up uh, in two years and ESPN has a direct to consumer product with three, four, five million customers? They have their email addresses, they're watching their patterns. Uh, this will be a very hard transition for them, but it could be a very profitable one eventually. And sure. I am super, super excited about uh, Hulu's live TV product. And I can tell you that once you use these $35, these unbundled services that give you a small, yep. skinny package, you are going to get rid of your cable subscription and you're going to move to it because it's more uh, effective for your family, especially if you have kids, to just have an account online and to manage it all via an app. Yep. Millions of households have already made that call. Um, one last thing, yeah. Eric, and this this relate. This is more broad on tech. We talk so often about uh, the market action narrowing to these five big names on the Nasdaq, and yet uh, others argue those are the names with secular growth in an economy that is hungry for secular growth. Are, um, are they overrepresented too much in terms of uh, both sentiment and buzz uh, and even valuation? You know, I don't think so. I think we're actually just in the beginning of a huge growth for all these names. And the reason being is simple, network effects. Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, all of these players are dealing with massive network effects that are just going to get better, better with scale over time. So I think that the secular trends are there for these players to continue to grow. And I don't think it's overrepresented by the market right now. I think we're really, we're really just in the first inning of a very long ball game for these players. Yeah, I, I would add to that the, the FAM index, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, Apple, and Microsoft. These companies now have virtual uh, monopolies. In fact, they figured out how to game uh, the Justice Department and uh, really become monopolies that are uh, immune to government action, at least here in the United States. If you look at Google, they have uh, just an amazing monopoly when it comes to search advertising, and they've they know exactly how to avoid triggering what would look like a monopoly. So they've always kept an anemic, <laughs> incompetent um, uh, competitor alive. So, you know, Google had Yahoo. They could have bought it. They could have taken over their advertising revenue. Suspiciously, they didn't. And then you look at Facebook. They've always had, and Zuckerberg's referred to it as the clown car, you know, the incompetent uh, Twitter, which can't seem to get out of its own way. These right. are perfect little companies to keep on the side. Don't buy them. Let them be independent so that when the antitrust people come, you can just say, look, no, there's, sure. there's options here. Um, right, yeah. And they've built moat after moat. Google's moats are transcendent now. Chrome, yeah. Android, just, one box. I mean, it's amazing the monopoly they've built that yeah, doesn't look like a, matter, a monopoly. A matter of whether other governments see it the same way as we do. <laughs> Guys, yeah. uh, that was good. Uh, good to see you both.